Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's workshop, Best Practices for Operating a Food Business Out of a Shared Space. Um, I'm Lindsay Day Farnsworth, Program Manager at the UW-Madison Division of Extension Community Food Systems Program, and I'm pleased to be a co-host of today's webinar. We have two great speakers with us today, Chris Brockle and Danelle Richards. Um, Chris is our first speaker, and he's manager at Feed Kitchens, a shared use commercial kitchen business incubator on the north side of Madison. Chris is responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the five kitchen, 5,400 square foot facility. He also supports the 80 entrepreneurs starting and operating their businesses at Feed in a variety of different ways, including providing technical assistance with food business startup, supporting their work in the kitchen, helping with product sourcing, marketing Feed, its members, and their products to the larger community, and a variety of other daily tasks too varied and numerous to list. Chris also coordinates Healthy Food for All, a food recovery and distribution project operating out of feed kitchens, and Chris serve, serves on the City of Madison Food Policy Council and has since its inception. So welcome, Chris. We look forward to hearing from you today. Um, just a couple quick housekeeping items before I, I hand it over, and that's please be sure um, for, for all of our participants that you mute yourself when you're not speaking. Um, we'll have an opportunity to have a question and answer period after both of the presentations. So feel free to put your questions into the chat box at any time, um, but save questions that you, that you choose to ask directly to the participants until after um, both presentations. You can open the chat box by clicking the chat icon at the bottom center of your screen. And lastly, I just wanna make a quick plug to complete our short program evaluation. Um, these evaluations help keep programs like this free and help improve future programming. So keep an eye on the chat box. We'll put the evaluation link in there a couple times. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Chris. Thank you, Lindsay. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. I thank you for being invited to, to speak. Um, and thank you everybody for showing up on a Monday afternoon in, in June to, to listen to folks like me um, talk away. The, um, I will say that I am at Feed Kitchens right now. I'm, I'm at work. Uh, it's kind of busy here right now. I would not be surprised if at some point during my presentation, someone walks to my door and asks a question and I will try to get them moved on as quickly as, as possible. But uh, it's kind of the nature of being, of being here. Um, next slide. So Feed Kitchens, if you're not familiar, is operated as a nonprofit by the Madison Northside Planning Council. Uh, we've been uh, open since November 2013. Uh, we are a shared use commercial kitchen food business incubator, which is a lot of words. And for people that aren't in the business, you usually have to break that down and explain to them what each of it means. Uh, but we help, uh, help food startups uh, get, get started. Uh, I would also say, and we'll get into this a little bit in, in a bit, um, we're a, a bit of a hybrid, so we are, we are an incubator, but, but it, in some cases we operate simply as a shared commissary kitchen for some folks. Um, we are a 5,400 square foot facility. We have five production spaces. Uh, we have dry storage, cold storage, and freezer storage available. Um, we are membership based, so if people want to operate a commercial business out of here, they become members. Uh, it's a lifetime membership, um, and <clears throat> when, once they do, then the facility, they get a, a key fob and access to the calendars, um, and it's available to them 24 hours a day, seven days a week um, for production use. Um, right now, we have 87 members. Uh, it's a mix of commercial uh, producers and uh, nonprofit and community groups. So part of our mission here is also to be uh, kind of a support uh, to the community. And so we have uh, nonprofit projects and community projects that happen here um, alongside the commercial production. Um, some successes, if you're in the Madison area, you might've heard of uh, some of these folks. Uh, Little Tibet started as a food cart, now a restaurant. Uh, Madison Chocolate Company has its own storefront. 100 Mile Sauce, uh, made it big uh, with, uh, started with ketchup, but made it big with Bloody Mary mix. Uh, and if you're gonna have drink mixes, you might as well have an old fashioned mix as well. Stray Dog, Beef Butter Barbecue is a restaurant. Driftless Chocolates has got their own production facility. So we can go on and on. Uh, Don, and Al, Don and Al and I have, have worked together in on a, a number of different things, but uh, one thing uh, we definitely worked side by side when he was here with uh, mentoring positives and off the block. So that's a social enterprise uh, that worked here making, they make uh, frozen pizzas here and will be moving uh, their salsa production here 
uh, soon as well. Um, next page. And there's a picture of feed kitchens if you haven't seen it before. So we are on the north side of Madison and we sit in the middle of a parking lot uh, in front of a strip mall. Um, but there we are. Next one. Inside of the kitchen, I wish I could say it looks this clean uh, every day, um, but you're looking from the back of one kitchen uh, through uh, two other production spaces. At the end of this picture, if you go right or left, there's two other production spaces as well. Um, next frame. Next frame. Uh, so operate uh, incubator kitchen, shared kitchen. You may have heard uh, both of those um, terms. Uh, also, commissary kitchen would be uh, uh, a term that's that's thrown around. Incubator kitchen and shared kitchens are similar facilities where food processors share space uh, for the production of their product. Uh, the difference between the two, it's it's uh, some might say it's a fine line, some might say it's a it's a very distinct line. But a shared kitchen is a space where space and equipment are rented uh, for the production um, of food and is shared with multiple entities. Um, so pretty much you're renting space to come in, use the facility, use the equipment. You're not getting other services, but you're getting access uh, uh, to, to resources that you don't necessarily have to buy um, yourself. They're made available to you for rent. Um, there is gonna be some level of support because anytime you're working in a shared space, you're working around other people who uh, are uh, empathetic, sympathetic, been through the same thing that you're going through and can offer each other support. Um, sometimes you'll hear a shared kitchen also called the commissary kitchen. Um, commissary probably has more sort of meal production uh, kind of things, ghost kitchens, uh, uh, food delivery services, things like that going out of them. Incubator kitchen is a shared kitchen space, uh, but also uh, much like the shared kitchen, but also provides uh, other services, so business development services, uh, orientation, how to use the equipment, uh, social media, financing, um, marketing, labeling, packaging, um, all of those kinds of things are, are supported uh, either by staff or by resources that are brought in. In either case, it is the business activity or product that is licensed, not the kitchen itself. So I get that question a lot. Are you a licensed kitchen? I need to be in a licensed kitchen. And my answer to that is we are a licensable kitchen. Um, your business is the thing that's licensed, not, not the feed kitchens itself. So we have 87 uh, businesses working out or projects working out of here, about 60 of them, 60 or 65 of them are commercial businesses. Those businesses are all individually licensed um, under the umbrella of, of feed kitchens. Um, <laughs> Next slide, please. <clears throat> so one of the things, regardless of uh, whatever shared space you're in, shared space, commissary, incubator, you <clears throat> one, of the, one of the things that you will need with your licensing authority is a shared statement of understanding between you and the facility itself. Um, and we have those forms here. We can, as you become a member here, that's just part of the... Um, <clears throat> the orientation. But basically, uh, the shared kitchen, you, when, once you become licensed, you're licensed to produce in this kitchen, not in other spaces. And that's important to know. Uh, as people are starting their businesses, sometimes they're starting in a, uh, you know, in a sort of an informal way. They may not understand all food safety rules. They may have been operating uh, a home-based bakery um, and so they're used to working from home and now they do some from home, some from the kitchen. Nope, once you're licensed in the kitchen, you do everything in that kitchen. You don't do some of it at home, some of it in the kitchen or some of it in this kitchen, some of it in a different kitchen. You do it, you do it right here. <clears throat> Your login and log outs are recorded and saved at the facility. Um, if you're at Feed Kitchens, we have binders for every member here that grab their binder. Um, log themselves in and out. We also have an electronic calendar that we can check uh, for ins and outs and, and health inspectors are interested in, in those things. When were you in the facility? Who else was in the facility when you were here? Um, things like that. Um, all your ingredients are stored here at the facility. Once they enter the facility, they don't leave unless they're leaving as a finished product that's gonna be sold or they're leaving and they're not coming back 
ever. That's a that's just a food safety thing. Um, equipment, utensils, packaging are stored here as well. Um, your procurement, your production, your shipping records are kept here. And your finished product can be kept here before it's shipped, or you can be part of a, another um, licensed food warehouse where your stuff is stored as well. Um, next screen, please. So what are the advantages of, of uh, being in a shared kitchen? Um, one of the obvious ones is reduced overhead. We have all the equipment here. We have close to a million dollars in various kinds of equipment here. Um, obviously not every producer needs to use all of, all of that equipment, um, but any single piece of equipment that most people want to use and, and the price, they're expensive. Um, and certainly coming out of the pandemic, things are even even more expensive, maybe even twice as much if you can get if you can get your hands on it. So you don't have to you don't have to invest in all the equipment. We have it here or the other kitchens, other kitchens you work in will have it. It's a good way to, to know whether I if I am thinking about moving into my own facility at some point, uh, what kind of equipment do I really need? Do, do I really know how to use this equipment? Is this something that is necessary or just nice to have? Um, so access to the equipment and reduced overhead. Obviously rent is extremely expensive. You're paying membership fees here and um, hourly kitchen usage, use fees, but you're not paying, you know, a thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollars a month uh, to, rent, to, to rent a full bricks and mortar facility. <clears throat> um, compliance with food safety, production regulations, we, have a licensable kitchen, we help keep it clean. Uh, if you're using it, you're helping to keep it clean as well. Um, but we're keeping the sort of the big picture stuff, right? We're cleaning the bathrooms, we're wiping down all the surfaces daily, we're mopping the floors, we're taking out the garbage. Um, all those things are, are being done and it helps you stay compliant um, with food safety and production regulations and also helps you focus on your production. Um, I think one of the big advantages here, and I can't state this enough, is you once you're in a shared space, you're with a network of, of like-minded entrepreneurs, uh, kitchen staff, and you have access to industry experts. So I think, uh, to me, you know, people talk about the support services that we offer here at Feed, and I can brag about them um, all day long if I um, am asked to. But I, I really think the best support that comes here is the peer-to-peer, -peer, the, the interaction between the, the entrepreneurs themselves, people who have lived it, people who have tried it, people who have succeeded, people who have failed and found different doors. Um, the, that kind of inside knowledge is just irreplaceable. And I, I'm happy to say here at Feed, we have a wonderful community of support uh, where people really help each other, even if they're making similar products. Uh, I think folks realize that uh, the rising tide lifts all boats and that even if someone is, even if we're both bakers, there's, there's room for both of us um, to succeed. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So if I'm looking at a shared kitchen space, what are the things that I wanna be looking at? Because um, not every shared space is going to be um, right for you. Um, and just because it exists doesn't mean uh, that that's where you have have to be or um, just because it exists doesn't mean that necessarily they have to bend to, to um, what your requirements are. Um, and so uh, get your questions ready, go in, take a look, kick the tires um, and see if it's actually going to work for you. Things that you want to look at, I think you're going to want to look at physical space, what is what kind of support services are being offered. And what is the culture within the kitchen itself? Um, so physical space, elbow room, table space, how much room is there here? Um, is there room to spread out or am I limited to a four by four area on a table and that's where I have to be? Um, how many staff can come in with me? Um, you know, here at uh, Feed, pretty much we would allow you to bring in, I mean, obviously there's a limit to the number of people, but you could bring in uh, what you need for production. During the pandemic, we limited any any business to have no more than four people at any given time in here doing production, uh, which is a lot really for, for most small um, producers. 
Um, are there, what types of equipment are there? What, what are your needs for equipment and what, what exists here? Um, and then I would, all, I would add to that, um, what is the orientation for using that equipment? I would uh, be, it would be suspect if, if places weren't offering orientation. Uh, I always say it's best for both of us because as an expensive piece of equipment, I want you to know how to use it right so you don't ruin it. You wanna know how to use it right so that you can uh, be as productive as possible without wasting time. Um, are there allowances for bringing in your own equipment? So I have, a, I have a freeze dryer, I'd like to bring it in. I have an ice cream maker, I'd like to bring it in. I have a dumpling uh, maker. Um, all those things um, are possible here at Feed. Um, I'm not gonna say it's possible at every shared kitchen, but you need to ask. So here at Feed, basically if you have a piece of equipment, we have room on a table, if it's a tabletop or room on the floor, if it's a piece of floor equipment. Um, you can have it here. We will charge you $25 a month to have it. Um, and then obviously that's your piece of equipment. Other people don't use it unless you give them permission to do so. Um, if you have, uh, if you need parking, if you're a food cart, uh, if you're a caterer and you have a trailer, um, things like that, what's parking like? Is it going to cost me? Is there enough of it? Can I park in the wintertime? Um, all those kinds of uh, questions. What is the availability of uh, dry storage, cooler storage, freezer storage? What is it now? What is the availability when it gets really busy? Um, do you ever run out of storage? Um, good questions to ask. I would say probably most facilities are gonna tell you that they um, have enough to, uh, <coughs> to help you out, but could use more. I know at Feed sometimes, especially in our freezer, uh, in our cooler, we approach 100% capacity in, in storage and are constantly scrambling to move people around. We've never failed to fit somebody in, but that day is gonna come at some point. So I hope not, hopefully not soon before we expand. Um, is there ability for other folks to receive deliveries for me? Here at Feed, uh, we receive uh, for folks throughout the day. Um, Otherwise, we would have uh, you know 60 vendors standing around on a daily basis waiting for waiting for trucks to show up, and so we just do that on people's behalf, um, receive the shipment, and then get it to storage where where it belongs. Um, are there distribution services offered? So once I have a finished product, is there anybody here who helps me get that product um, moved to where it's going to be sold? Uh, what are the marketing opportunities? Do you are, do they have uh, uh, vendor fairs, do they have markets? Do they have outdoor markets? Um, are they connected? Do they have any special agreements with any uh, retailers that would agree to take uh, product that's being made here? Um, things like that. Um, cleanliness, that's an uh, easy one to tell as you're walking around, how clean is the facility? What are, what are the expectations of me as a, uh, to clean as well as I use the facility? What are the rules in the facility? Um, are there any special uh, special things that I would need to know that are different from how I might operate uh, in, a, in a space by myself? Is organic certification possible in this facility? Uh, at Feed, the answer is yes. We've had uh, a number of folks become uh, organic certified. Um, is uh, gluten-free or allergen-free production available in the facility? Uh, important one. There's a lot of, lot of uh, gluten-free products uh, being made and also interest in, in from consumers. Uh, here at Feed Kitchens, we cannot do gluten-free. We have way too many bakers and bakeries going. Um, there's too much flour dust in the air. And it's just, we don't have a clean area that we could call gluten-free. So folks that want to, want to have gluten-free products, the best they can do here is say made with non-gluten um, ingredients, but they can't necessarily call it gluten-free. <clears throat> what support services are being offered? What is the array of producers? How many food carts? How many caterers? Do you have sauce makers? How many different types of hot sauce are being made? Um, things like that. Um, sort of get a sense of the competition, sort of get a sense of the support as well. Who else is here doing similar things that I can, that I can talk to? What is the commitment from me? What is, is there a contract? Do I have to sign up for lifetime? Do I have to sign up for a year? Do I have to sign up for a month? Um, 
what, what's involved what's involved there um what is the cost so here at feed kitchens lifetime membership is four hundred dollars it's two hundred dollar security deposit two hundred dollar application orientation fee you are now a lifetime member um then beyond that there's a cost for use of the kitchen the highest cost anyone is going to pay is thirty dollars an hour but we have a variety of plans we have nonprofit pricing um, we have a special food cart uh, pricing because we while we don't have while we don't share actual production spaces food carts do here um, because otherwise we just can't move the number of food carts out that that would be um, that would be required um, and, and finally, talk to other people who are producing here. What do they say about the place? Um, what, is, what is the culture? Uh, what are the support services like? How do you feel when you're producing there? Um, next slide, please. All right, in a shared kitchen, who's responsible for what? So I'm gonna be here, who, what do I do? What do you do? Um, so kitchen owner operator, uh, in that case, that would be me or feed kitchens. Uh, what are we responsible for? We're responsible for the overall cleanliness of the facility inside and out. We're responsible for pest control. We're responsible for the maintenance of the equipment. We, in, we are responsible to ensure all members are operating by the rules and the regulations of the facility. Um, we maintain a calendar and a schedule um, for producers. Uh, we inspect all areas for proper storage of ingredients. So we, so part of my job is just to walk around in the storage areas and make sure um, things are being stored properly. Um, and we'll get into the reasons why in just a little bit. I think you can guess. Um, we also maintain relationships with, with the licensing authority. So I've been working with DACAP uh, just today on scheduling office hours here uh, so they can come in and catch up on in-person inspections and then I also reach out to the members who need those inspections to make sure that they um, know it's, that the, the sanitarian is going to be here and to set up a time for them to, to meet with her. Um, and finally, uh, modeling good behavior and the culture that's expected in the facility itself. Um, so anyone that's worked in a kitchen in a busy kitchen knows that it can be stressful knows that sometimes uh, people can get a little short, uh, tempers can, can flare, uh, uh, things can get a little testy. Um, so basically here, uh, we don't allow that. So we don't have prima donnas working in, in feed, at feed kitchens. Not that people don't ever get frustrated, but, uh, but you know, we have a wide variety of, of skill levels and experience working here. We want everyone to feel uh, accepted and uh, dignified. Um, so we do, certainly uh, do not put up with people walking around the kitchen, uh, cussing, yelling, throwing things, stomping, um, getting, uh, looking down uh, or elbowing out other people because for whatever reason, they think they're more deserving of whatever space or piece of equipment. Um, so those things just don't happen here. Um, or not that they don't happen here, but when they do, they're they're called out right away. And, and we really do have a, a wonderful uh, supportive, supportive culture. Uh, you may also wanna look at the kind of the mix of producers. So what, so <clears throat> are there people that are gonna be like me uh, here? So here at, at Feed, we specialize in, well, we'll work with anybody, but we specialize in, in uh, low income access, access for women, access for uh, people of color. Um, 55% of our members here are women-owned businesses. 53% of our businesses here are businesses owned by people of color. Um, so when folks come in, they can see themselves, they can feel uh, uh, represented here as well. They can be feel part of a larger community and also feel part of kind of a, that food culture where everyone is, uh, you know, food brings people together from all over the world. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as a business owner, what are you responsible for? So you would be responsible for sanitizing your own workspace and equipment prior to production. Uh, after production, cleaning your workspace and equipment um, so that it's ready for the next person. Uh, 
Uh, you are responsible for storing your ingredients and products properly, um, <clears throat> maintaining all your production records, maintaining your licensing, uh, creating a recall plan um, for your product, uh, communicating with the shared kitchen operator. So that would be myself and, and staff here. What is it I want, I'm trying to do? What is it I need to do? Do I have a shipment coming in? Do I have a piece of equipment coming in? Do I have someone stopping in that, that needs to pick something up? Um, it's amazing what people don't tell you <laughs> on any given day and, and the surprises that come your way. But my job is a lot easier and I can be a lot more supportive if you let me know uh, what's going on with your business. Uh, and finally, maintaining positive relationships with the other people here in the facility. Um, that's a biggie. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so one thing we tell everybody here is, and this is true whether it's in this in this space or in in your own space, um, but I think a little bit more true here, um, simply because of the number of businesses that we have, and that's anytime a sanitarian is is or a food inspector is in the premises, and they can come anytime, they can inspect any business or or operation working out of this facility, whether they're present or not. So they may show up to, to, to inspect one business, but that doesn't mean they're not looking at it, everything else that's going on in the kitchen. It doesn't mean that they're not walking through storage <clears throat> and checking storage areas to make things, make sure things are stored properly. Um, one little dirty secret, at least from this uh, shared kitchen operator is if, if, some, if I have tried my hardest to get somebody to to operate uh, by the rules and, and uh, cleanliness um, or sanitation, and I am failing at it. When an inspector is here, I may actually pull them aside and ask them to, to take a look at that person's um, storage area or their production practices um, as, as well. Um, not something I wanna do. I certainly don't wanna be a tattletale, but it's also very important um, that Everybody's following the rules. Uh, next slide, please. And this is why it's important that everyone follows the rules because anything that anyone does in this facility affects everybody else. So the, th the decisions and the actions that you take affect the other vendors here. The, the decisions other vendors take uh, and the actions that they take affect, affect you. And so, you certainly don't want to be the person that's responsible for someone to have to throw out a bunch of product because a sanitarian came in and something was amiss and therefore anything that was being made in the facility at that moment would have to be tossed. Um, you certainly don't want to be the, the person who stored your product wrong and then uh, drip meat juice all over somebody else's, somebody else's stuff. Um, so there's lots of things that could go wrong. You need to operate in a, a um, clean and regulated manner and have the expectation that other people are doing doing the same thing so that everybody has a safe product that can go out and, and be marketed. Um, as anybody knows, it, it only takes one bad instance, whether it's you or somebody else in this facility and that to be publicized um, <clears throat> to ruin the confidence in everything that's being made here. And that would hurt everybody. Um, next slide, please. Um, and what are those things that, that could go wrong? So certainly um, cross-contamination, um, somebody left uh, raw seafood out uh, on sitting on a counter and there it sits and nobody knows how long it's been sitting there, but there it is. Um, person before you doesn't clean up. So you, you have a reservation for the kitchen, you walk into the kitchen and there's grease all over the floor. There are, um, there's, chicken breading all over the tables. Um, tables aren't wiped down. Um, garbages aren't empty. So these are things that are gonna take up your time um, and affect your production because the person before you didn't, didn't do the things that they were expected. Um, missing or misplaced ingredients um, can certainly happen. There's three storage areas. There's 80 some vendors working out of here. Um, sometimes things go missing. Um, what I have found in my, my experience is that generally if someone in probably more than 50% of the cases of somebody claiming that something has been taken from them, 
uh, it's really the case that they misplaced it and didn't remember where they put it. Um, but that's that's not to say things don't sometimes get taken. Generally, uh, here at Feed Kitchens, if what happens is somebody borrows a little, you know, I need I need a cup of corn syrup or canola oil or whatever it is. I borrowed it from somebody, but I didn't put it back in the right place. Um, generally, you shouldn't be doing that. You should be asking regardless, um, but it does happen. We have cameras here. That's another thing you can check on security at any given shared kitchen. We actually have cameras in all of our production areas and our storage areas, so we can go back and check and look uh, to see what happened. Um, and we do occasionally do that. So. Um, another thing that can go wrong is a failure to use a calendar. We use something called Food Corridor. It's a web-based calendar. Um, if uh, people can reserve time in it in any space that's not already reserved, they can claim as their own. Uh, but what happens sometimes is that people don't use the calendar or don't look at the calendar and then they show up and start doing production. Um, and then somebody else thinks that the kitchen is free and they show up and want to do production. And then suddenly we have, we're butting heads uh, and we have <clears throat> hurt feelings because people either made time in their day, went out of their way or, or uh, to get here and then the production space wasn't, wasn't truly available to them. Um, working around others with various levels of experience and knowledge. Um, not necessarily a bad thing because you're going to learn from them, but you're also got to remember that uh, they may, other people may not have the, the level of experience that you do, and therefore you may need to stop and, and help and be supportive and, and um, train them. Uh, I know that for some of our members here, because we do have this community aspect where we work with nonprofits and community groups as well, uh, sometimes, you know, those folks are only in the kitchen, maybe maybe once or twice, and then they're not coming back. Um, so they don't know necessarily how to operate in a, in a commercial kitchen. And that's one of the things we talk to our members about um, right here is just, just, just part of being part of the space is, is being a community member as well. Um, certainly negative behavior, the prima donnas, the walking around here, the, the stopping, the swearing, the um, throwing stuff, uh, that just makes it, just makes it for a, a a bad atmosphere and nobody likes that. Um, and then finally, just miscommunication it happens all the time, right? So let's, you know, communicate clearly with, with the shared kitchen operators, communicate clearly with, with other folks here and, you know, good communication goes a long way in, in covering up uh, and moving things forward and, and getting through issues. Um, next slide, I think, I think I'm closing to the end. Yes, I am. That's my thank you for taking the time to listen to me. I hopefully I didn't go too fast and covered what you wanted to know. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to join you again at any other time to talk, but uh, also going to give it up for Donnell. So thank you. Thanks so much, Chris. What a great overview of key considerations at the facility scale. I think that's um, a, a perfect lead up to, to Donnell's presentation, which will focus um, on key considerations from the business perspective. Um, before I introduce uh, Donnell, I wanted to provide a little bit of um, background on, on who he is and share his bio um, with you all. Donnell was born and raised in Madison. He had a diverse cultural upbringing with his father immigrating from Jamaica, stepfather immigrating from the Gambia, and his mother migrating from the coastal DMV area, that's Washington, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. While studying biological systems engineering at UW-Madison, Donnell came to appreciate home-cooked meals and saw how much his peers craved non-Wisconsin foods. He decided to develop recipes with family members and figured out how to cook meals in large batches. After sharing with friends and family, his confidence grew and he started Madtown Food Services in 2019. Now entering its third year, Donnell and company are excited to expand the catering service to include vending participation at local events and offering a delivery service for prepared meals. Outside of MFS, uh, Donnell operates Another business, Urban Ponics, works part-time at the Michael Fields Agricultural Institute and serves as a member of the Dane County Food Council. Danelle, um, welcome, and we'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Lindsay, for such a nice uh, introduction. 
Um, want to give a quick shout out to Chris, to Chris. You killed it. You covered pretty much everything I was going to talk about. So uh, I'm going to not duplicate stuff and just keep it short and simple. Um, really just want to be able to share more about my experience um, as a business owner in shared uh, commercial kitchen spaces. Um, but I do kind of want to touch on uh, my business as it, uh, I guess, somewhat is an incubator um, for my family members as they are um, operating kind of their own uh, business venture. Um, and so I just wanted to uh, speak on a couple of those things and just help folks think about, um, you know, the structure of your business as you first start. Um, for me personally, uh, as Lindsay had mentioned, um, I really started this because of, you know, what I've seen within my family. Um, I, I have a family full of cooks. I commonly refer to uh, my operation as I got an army <laughs> of cooks. Um, so you let me know what you want, you know, cooked, and I'm sure someone in my family can cook it uh, very well. Um, but with that, you know, just because of that deep passion, um, a lot of my family members have always had this dream of starting a food business. And I'm sure many of the people here in the room are, you know, in a very similar position, have either started themselves or still in the planning stages. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, share uh, some sympathy with you all. I mean, it's it's a really exciting process. And, you know, the, the times that we are living in, it's, it is a good opportunity to start a food business, as we've seen a lot of, you know, existing businesses kind of transitioning out, um, leaving opportunities for new businesses to kind of come in. Um, but, you know, the, the beauty of all of this is that it's around food and food is so central to so many different cultures. Um, for me, I, you know, obviously learned that through my family members, but as I got older and tried new foods, I was like, wow, like I'm missing so much of life right here. And so for me, I've, I've really found it um, beyond just something that you eat every day it's it's really about uh um my own identity and you know how i carry myself and really just trying to open up opportunities for other people who don't necessarily have um you know access to good quality food or just are even aware of you know different food options um in the world so definitely want to support you all and saying that you're doing a really good job by joining these uh, sessions there's I know another one next week, uh, Monday, that kind of talks about um, cooperative spaces. So definitely, you know, join in on that because that's a, a innovative model that's actually been around for quite some time. But I just think, you know, people again are becoming new to, you know, business models and such. So um, with that, uh, Mads Home Food Services is primarily a catering service. Um, I have uh, done a couple, uh, I shouldn't say a couple. I've done quite a bit of events, uh, catering. You know, I've done small uh, office parties. I've done block parties. I've done birthday parties, graduation parties. I mean, you name it. <laughs> um, I've also done, you know, small private orders for just family friends who are like, wow, I really love that jerk chicken. Like, can I get a pan of that? I'm like, I got you. Um, so there, there's a lot of ways to kind of operate. Um, as a caterer, uh, it provides a lot of flexibility. Um, there is some very basic things that you would need. Um, and the biggest one is having a base kitchen. Um, as you may be doing a lot of mobile um, activities, going to different places to actually like serve the food, you actually need a commercial kitchen to produce the food. Um, so I'll speak to that in a little bit. Um, but the other ways that I operate Madtown Food Services is, um, I guess if you want to look at it from a licensing perspective, um, it's a temporary food stand, which means I show up in a space at a designated time and say, I'm serving these meals um, for the duration of this event. It's not something that is intended to be like every single day. It's more so to be like kind of one, two or three times, you know, every other week or every other month. Um, again, emphasizing on the temporary aspect of that. Um, a lot of that you may recognize as our festivals here in Madison or, you know, in other places in the state. Um, you can kind of think of um, maybe the, uh, the Wisconsin State Fair and how they have a ton of food vendors at, at that location. Um, so it is a very common type. Um, and I definitely recommend for those who are just starting a food business to really explore that licensing option 
as again, it provides a lot of um, a lot less stress <laughs> when it comes to licensing requirements, but it also gives you a really good opportunity to get out in public and test your food out to folks. Um, there's a couple other ways that I operate this business that I, um, it's more so in the future, I still have to kind of uh, really focus on um, the, the previous uh, uh, services of catering and temporary food stands, but I do have a lot of interest in food processing activities. Um, I am a certified, a certified, a certified food processor. Um, and if you have more questions around that, I'm not necessarily the best one to ask, but I think Barb Ingham is on the phone and um, she is definitely the one to go to with a lot of your questions around those uh, specialized types of licensing. Um, you know, some other areas that I'm really exploring too within my business is a delivery service. So, you know, how do you take um, prepackaged meals and distribute them into the community? Um, it's actually pretty simple from a licensing perspective. However, the products that you're making is, is really where the licensing um, is more heavily uh, regulated. And so um, I can kind of speak to a lot of different types of business operations. Um, you know, for me, I've really uh, had a good opportunity to, to teach my family members about this stuff. Um, you know, some of them were like, I just want to cook. I have some family members who actually want to learn the business stuff, you know, the things that you have to do um, outside of the kitchen. Um, to be a business owner, um, I'm just going to speak from experience. You know, the more that you can do um, as much of, you know, the administrative and the cooking, the, the better it'll give you a, um, a, a clear idea of how you truly want to operate your business long term. Um, when you first get started, you're probably going to jump to any single or to every opportunity that's thrown at you. And, you know, that's really exciting. But at some point, you probably will find it very overwhelming. And you're like, all right, I just need to focus. Um, so just know that I am, you know, entering year three, I'm now in the focus point in my business as it develops. But um, because of all of my previous experiences, I'm really happy to share with you all what I've learned and really just trying to um, help point you in the right direction as you move forward. Um, so I guess the last thing I want to mention about Mad Tom Food Services is that, um, you know, that with my family members, there are essentially three DBAs or trade names. Um, one is Irie Roots, and that's some of the work that I do with my father. Um, I have uh, the Smiling Coast Cuisine, which is um, an entity that will soon become its own entity um, outside of Mad Tom Food Services, and that's um, being operated by my stepfather. Um, I also have Collective Cuisines, which is an operation that I am working with my mother. Um, and so there are ways to kind of um, separate, you know, different trade names for different types of services that you do. Um, the way that I do it at Madtown Food Services is, you know, if my family members want to branch out at any point, you know, for me, I'm just trying to teach them the, the very fundamentals so that they have the tools to, to be their own legal entity. Um, so that's it. I'm gonna move on to the next slide. <laughs> So Chris did mention this before. I actually got a lot of my first experience in a shared commercial kitchen space um, at Feed Kitchens. And so while I am happy to share about that experience there, Chris you know, went over the, those details uh, pretty well, so I don't necessarily wanna like duplicate anything. However, the current space that Madtown Food Services operates in is called Christine's Kitchens which is actually not that far from Feed Kitchens. It's, I don't know, maybe a mile or two. Um, I can't quite figure out the direction off the top of my head, but it's off of East Washington. And for people who are in Madison, you should probably recognize this area pretty well. It's in the Madison East uh, Shopping Center. So there's a lot of different businesses, but one of the little uh, doors is Christine's Kitchens. Um, next slide, please. To show you what it looks like from the outside perspective, um, the picture on the left is the front entrance of Christine's Kitchens. So you can just pull up and walk through that front door that has a sign there, um, slide potato chips. Um, that is the product um, that the owner of Christine's Kitchens produces. And that actually was you know, one of the main reasons why Christine had purchased the facility was to be able to produce um, her potato chip brand. 
Um, over time, she has opened the space to a lot of other food vendors. And so um, just like feed kitchens, there's a variety of food carts, caterers, um, bakers. Um, I mean, you name it with Christine's kitchens have, has seen a lot too. Um, in fact, I think a lot of uh, vendors between feed kitchens and Christine's kitchens kind of go back and forth depending on what you know stage they're at in the business. Um, the picture on the right is the back of the kitchen, the area that is painted in blue and full of all sorts of colors. That's actually where the door is. Um, and so to the right of it, you can kind of see some of the disposal areas with garbage, um, oil, you know, please don't put oil down sinks, <laughs> bring that outside. Um, and the little space to the right of that is kind of an unloading zone for people who come from events and they have all their equipment that they need to drop off and clean off, you know, that's most mostly what that back door entrance is used for. Um, what you don't see is there is a parking lot across the street, and that is a very common space for uh, food carts um, or other businesses with large vehicles to be able to park there overnight. Um, so this facility has, you know, some of the same features that Feed Kitchens has, um, but it does operate um, a little bit different in the sense that it doesn't necessarily um incubate businesses as to the degree that feed kitchens does but it still has a really strong peer-to-peer -peer support network um where people will you know just freely give you advice um and oftentimes a lot of unsolicited advice <laughs> um next slide please so this is kind of the schematic of the kitchen i wasn't able to get pictures of the facility in time um but um, it's pretty open, you know, as long as you contact Christine, you know, you are more than welcome to come visit and check out the space. Um, so I will just kind of go over the schematic and explain in some of the areas within the kitchen. Um, in the, oh gosh, top of the diagram, um, it's a storage area that is primarily for dry goods. So meaning there's a bunch of people who will get, you know, six foot tall racks, um, four foot tall racks. I mean, six foot is pretty common, but um, it's just a massive area full of racks. <laughs> um, you know, oftentimes uh, it's where people put kind of their packaging materials, um, dry ingredients or canned goods. Um, and then any equipment that they use um, for events. And for some vendors, it's equipment that they actually use in the kitchen, but they do not allow other people to access it publicly. Um, so that is essentially what the dry storage area is. Um, the area where it has kind of four different sections, you'll see an example of some businesses that have been there in the past. Um, it says looking glass. Origin Breads, um, Castellet, or Ugly Apple. Um, you all may know of those brands. Some of them are still at the uh, kitchen today. Some of them have moved on into a separate facility because they are growing. Um, so within this section, it's called the white tile space. Um, I believe it's a 12 by 12 foot space um, for tenants to actually build out. So they will bring in their own tables, bring in their own refrigeration units, bring in their own cookware, utensils, things like that. Um, that is a little bit different than what other vendors have used in the space. Um, just know that that is you know, pretty much at full capacity at this time. Um, and those rental agreements are set up as um, monthly leases or their year round leases set up on a monthly payment. Um, in the space below that, um, you'll kind of see uh, prep sinks, bathrooms, um, a dish room, things like that. Those are very common spaces open to all vendors. Um, obviously you need a bathroom to <laughs> uh, do your business, um, but there's a lot of prep sinks and things like that that are also very much in shared use in that facility. Um, I do want to highlight that not all sinks are used for the same purpose. So if you are new to kitchens, just know that that is a very strict rule in many facilities. If it is a sink that says produce only, it means produce only. <laughs> no meats, you know, don't wash your hands in them, don't do anything except for fruits and vegetables and, and things like that. Um, you know, that's, 
there's a lot of reasons behind it. Um, if you really want to know, you know, there's some food code uh, language. If you want to read, you know, legislative language, I doubt you want to do that. So your best probably <laughs> to listen to the, uh, the kitchen managers and just follow their rules. Um, now there are other things, obviously, for hand washing only. Um, some are for dishwashing, um, most commonly the three compartment sinks, where one compartment is for washing, one compartment is for rinsing, one compartment is for sanitizing. Um, and obviously there are sinks that are available to, you know, thaw out uh, meats if they're frozen, or if you wanted to wash meats, things like that. There are other sinks for those uses as well. Um, the dish room here, I will say, um, is very limited. It's pretty, on, pretty much only one person can use at a time. Um, but it is a really nice piece of equipment where it washes and sanitizes, you know, in one go. Um, very much like feed kitchens, they have a very similar setup over there. Um, but here, just know that it's a really tight space. And, you know, after you get done washing it, you do need, you know, space to put it on a rack to kind of dry out properly you know if for most uh rules you're not supposed to wipe down things to dry it you're supposed to let it air dry um so there's just a lot of those things that kind of come into play as you get uh deeper into the business um but again you know there's so many people who work in these spaces who follow these rules for decades so you know you always have people in this kitchen to be able to kind of help you through this process and learn about best practices. Um, but I do kind of want to mention that, you know, that's one of the benefits of having a dry storage space is to be able to accommodate, um, you know, all of your supplies and things in other spaces if, you know, spaces like the dish room are, are really uh, at capacity. And the bottom half of this diagram, you'll see it uh, titled as the prep area. Here you'll see about five tables that are semi-permanent. I mean, they can be moved around, but you're not supposed to move them. Um, those tables kind of operate for um, like hourly tenants. So people who want to just come in for a few hours um, in a, uh, at a time, um, really they are able to reserve a table. Um, to do their prepping activities or use it as um, space to put like cooked goods after they get it done in the stove area. Um, so as you can see on the left part of that bottom uh, diagram in the pep prep area, um, it does say, you know, there are burner stoves, there's ovens, there's a hood, ventilation system, there are fryers, things like that. That is some of the examples of what shared commercial facilities can offer you. And as Chris mentioned, those things are expensive. <laughs> um, for those who don't really know about kitchens, one of the basic requirements, especially if you're cooking, um, especially if you're frying foods, you will need a hood. And the hood systems and all that can cost a quarter million dollars like very easily. Um, some of the more advanced systems can be multi-million dollars. Um, so if you're thinking about shared kitchen or your own facility, check the prices on the hood first, and that might help you <laughs> make a decision on where you want to start. Um, but, you know, the, the other things are the burners and the ovens. Um, at this kitchen, there are kind of two different types of ovens. You know, one that you would most commonly see in your own household. Um, and then there are ovens that are a little bit more specialized, like convection ovens. Um, I learned a lot about the difference between the two, and I definitely messed up a lot of my dishes <laughs> cooking um, in, you know, two different types of setups. So what I will really highly encourage is that as you are reaching out and learning about kitchen facilities and things like that, you may be like, yeah, this is good to go. Really test your products. If you have a recipe and you're like, I need this to be consistent every time I go in there. What you may find challenging is that the equipment that may have worked in your household may not necessarily cook the same exact way as the equipment in the kitchen. You know, in this case, the burner or the, the stove tops, they are massive flames, which means you got to be really careful, you know, controlling the temperature. Otherwise, you know, if you're cooking something like rice and beans, you can burn the pot and, you know, you your food won't taste that great. <laughs> um, you know, for me, when I've cooked jerk chicken, sometimes I cook it in the oven and sometimes I'll burn it to a crisp and I'm like, oh, that's a little too cooked for me. Like, uh, 
y'all got to throw away, you know, $60 worth of product because I messed up not knowing how the temperature and time works in some of these equipments. Um, so that's essentially kind of what this space looks like. I will mention that there is a walk-in freezer, a walk-in refrigerator. Um, those things are accessible to um, vendors in the space. However, they get to full capacity very, very quickly. And as Chris has mentioned um, and emphasized, I mean, storage is probably the number one thing that's challenging working in these spaces. And I'll kind of speak to that um, very shortly here. Uh, other things to know about the kitchen, there's about 10 plus vendors who share this space. Um, and you know, if you're interested in operating in this space, the best way um, to figure it out is to contact Christine. Um, you, some of the most common things that you wanna consider when filling out applications for these types of spaces is insurance policies. And I included that it's very common to see that you need coverage for a million dollars of liability. Um, and then you also want to be able to understand what that cap, um, or if you're just operating in Dane County, what public health of Madison and Dane County license um, you want to operate. Uh, don't say we have a whole lot of time, so I'm going to go through these next space uh, pages really quickly. So next slide, please. Um, so just some questions, and I'll just quickly respond to them. Um, what about working in a shared uh, kitchen? Do you wish you knew when you first started your business? As I kind of mentioned, storage availability is what it comes down to. Um, for me, starting a business, I didn't necessarily know exactly everything that I needed, um, especially when it comes to packaging material. I was like, oh, I'm going to use this, and then I'm going to try this, and I'm going to try that. But when I started buying in bulk and I have these big old boxes, I'm like, wow, okay, I need a lot of space to accommodate just the packaging material. Um, but then outside of that, I was like, well, I want to get my own specialized pots because the pots at the kitchen don't necessarily cook the things I like to, you know, cook them at. So there's a lot of things that come into play, especially when um, you have limitations to storage. Um, and for those who are working with frozen products, like that is going to be your biggest challenge. I, you know, Chris can tell you, but many other commercial kitchen spaces in the city, freezer space is ridiculously hard to find. Um, you may want to consider investing in that piece of equipment up front and being able to find a space that you can properly license to have that just as a storage unit itself. Um, the other thing that I really wish I knew when I started was like how difficult it is to do it all by yourself. I can do a lot by myself, don't get me wrong, but as a young person, I'm starting to get back issues and all these things because I'm like, putting in 10, 12 hours a day shifts. And that I'm like, I gotta make my life easier. I got health that I'm trying to you know, maintain as a young person. So having an extra hand or two is critical. And I really encourage you to find out um, who in your network is willing to even just volunteer a shift or two a week, um, just to kind of help support you in the startup uh, stage. Next slide, please. What are the pros and cons of working in a space like Feed versus a restaurant? Um, Chris hit a lot of this, so I'm just going to echo a lot of these things. Um, minimize costs. There's a lot of overhead, equipment, supplies, things like that, that will just eat up your you know, ability to make profits. Um, the profit game in restaurants or any food business are really slim, so you know, it's really important that you minimize costs as much as possible. And the best way to do that starting out is to work in a shared commercial kitchen space personally. Um, the other pros is mentoring or guidance, motivation from other tenants. Um, and lastly, I mean, you get to try a lot of tasty food. Um, I've really been blessed with that and inspired by other people's um, offerings. I'm like, oh, I got to try. Like, I'm stopping going to Culver's. You know, let me let me go hit up this business and, you know, support them with their, you know, place that they're offering for the day. Um, cons, working in extra tight spaces. Um, how I kind of describe it, you're doing a dance in that kitchen. Some people know how to dance. Some people just step on their toes. <laughs> and in this type of shared space, um, you will work very closely with people working with really hot objects, working with knives, things like that. So um, you just have to kind of be aware of the space that you occupy, but also the space that you're trying to navigate. Second point a lot of stuff happens. And, you know, for many things, it's out of your control. If the something is wrong with the cooler, you know, and the refrigeration unit is out, 
your product is probably going to be done, you know, and it's not necessarily your fault. Um, but that's kind of some of the risks associated in working in these spaces is, you know, there's a lot of stuff that can happen. Um, the last thing is, you know, challenging personalities. You may be a really friendly person. You may be a person that doesn't want to talk to anyone while you're working. You see a mix of everything in these kitchens. And so, you know, just make sure that you're able to focus on your work, but also, you know, managing the other uh, personalities that are in the kitchen space. Next slide, please. What are some of the challenges you encountered working in a shared kitchen space and what methods have you used to navigate them? Scheduling kitchen use is everything, y'all. I can't express it enough. I really like feed kitchens. They have a really good system of scheduling. And so um, that is one benefit when you're working in that space. Um, for me at Christine's Kitchens, it's a little bit more loose where you kind of just work with tenants and just figure out, you know, when they come in and try to work with that. For me, I just find that late evenings, early mornings, really no one's trying to work then. So I'm like, all right, I'll go in then. Um, other things, scaling up recipes, I kind of mentioned it before, the heat levels and timing is everything. So you just have to keep on working on your batch sizes, you know, maybe scale it down a little bit and slowly work your way up. Um, you may also find out what specialized cooking equipment you need um, to better improve your recipes over time. Last thing, um, I did a lot of pop-up events in the space where customers would come and pick up the food, um, but because Christine's Kitchens is in a weird area, like a shopping center, just like feed, it's like, where do we go? Where's the front entrance and all that? Well, for me, I just started to learn the importance of marketing. And for me, I just specifically use social media to you know, set up event pages and make sure I take pictures of the entrance and all of that stuff, um, really as much as I can to really communicate where this location is. Um, Next slide, please. And then what resources have you taken advantage of at the local or state level to support the development of your food business and what made them useful? I just gave out this list. Please write down these names, y'all, because they are so useful. Um, without my time at Mentoring Positives doing you know, off-the-block products, I really wouldn't have known a lot of what I'm telling you about today. That was really my first opportunity to learn about this, and it was really through the peer networking opportunities, especially through the, the Madison Public Markets Market Ready Program. Um, there was a lot of free workshops, consulting opportunities, things like that, but also professionals like you know, Christine of Christine's Kitchens, Chris, you know, and Marty Mickelson is also fantastic. Um, you know, Tony Clark or Mango Man, those who have had food from Cafe Costa Rica, he's, he's been a really big mentor for me. Um, and same as Barb Ingham. I mean, you, there's so many people in this state, like y'all should understand that Wisconsin is a really great place to start a food business because of so many resources that are available. Um, also go to DATCAP Public Health. They have really uh, helpful staff to help you navigate licensing, things like that. WIBIC or the Wisconsin Women's Business Initiative Corporation, they do a lot of courses. For me, I learned how to do QuickBooks and cash flow and things that I need to do to develop my business plan to get loans in the future for the business. Uh, I also took advantage of UW-Madison's Law and Entrepreneurship Clinic. They also have a business and entrepreneurship clinic. Um, really great resource there. And financially, I also got a lot of support from the Kiva loan program um, and uh, from a CDFI known as the First American uh, Capital Corporation. Definitely learn about these CDFIs, y'all. They have a lot of funding available for those who are having a hard time getting loans from banks and things like that. Um, so there's so much more, but those are like my quick ones that I definitely want to plug. Um, and I think that should be it, but check the next slide just in case. Okay, oh, that'll do it. <laughs> My apologies for going over, but I'm all done now. <laughs> I guess, um, is it Aaron or Nick? You want to take over the next part? Yeah, happy to answer the questions too. <laughs> thanks to know. Um, yeah, that's fantastic and no problem at all. I think this is really great information. So uh, we do have plenty of time, uh, that being said, for questions. So I want to open up the floor for folks to either um, post questions in the chat 
for um, to uh, hop in, unmute yourself. Obviously, it's a big group of people on here. So just uh, kind of, if you do uh, unmute yourself and uh, want to pose a question, feel free to do so. Also feel free to direct it either to Chris or Danella or both. Um, but to start with, it looks like we do have a few questions in the chat. Um, and before I uh, uh, field those, I do want to um, also uh, reiterate uh, to uh, encourage you all to fill out um, our survey. So um, my colleague, Lindsay Day Farnsworth, has posted a link to the survey in the chat box. Um, if, you, if you've hopped on a little bit late, you can access the chat box uh, just by scrolling to the bottom of your screen. Uh, there should be a button where you can click chat. Um, like I said, feel free to ask your questions and to go to that survey. Uh, but the first question I'll pose is uh, from Mindy. Uh, Mindy asks, how do you prevent theft or of ingredients or other materials in a shared space? Um, I'd let uh, either or both of you guys field that question. Um, perhaps uh, you might reframe that if, if you feel it's need to do so, need to do so. I think uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start, Donnell. I don't know if you have any experience with this at Christine's or here at Feed even, you know, go ahead, tell the truth. <laughs> uh, it's a logical question, obviously, if you're in a shared space and, and if you've come through our dry storage, cooler storage, freezer storage, you'll see that shelving is wide open. There, there's a lot of material here. Uh, it would seem very logical that some of that might be taken off my shelf and used by somebody else or go missing. Um, and I will tell you that while it's logical and it, and it, it does happen on occasion, it probably happens far, far less than when what people think that it might. Um, you know, again, people are here, uh, they're part of a community, they, they may not feel part of that community when they first enter, but it does not take long before people sort of feel the warm wrap of everybody's support around them. And, and who, who certainly wants to do something negative uh, against that, so I think that I think that helps with the atmosphere. Now, to, to say that I've I would be remiss if I didn't say it, it doesn't happen at all because it, it certainly does. We have security cameras here at Feed, so people know that they know that those cameras are pointing at them, and that we have the ability to go look at any any given space, uh, any given time, whether we're we're here or not. So that that's a strong deterrent. Um, and finally, like I said during my presentation, I find that probably more than fifty. 50% of the time that uh, material or a piece of uh, equipment or their favorite slotted spoon or whatever it is uh, that goes missing, um, that they think somebody else may have taken from them ends up being misplaced by themselves, um, to be really honest with you. Um, <clears throat> uh, working with entrepreneurs is wonderful. They're wonderfully creative. Um, they have fantastic ideas. Um, <laughs> But they also aren't always linear in their thinking. Um, and when I, say, when I say that, sometimes they're a little spacey. Um, but they're also very busy. They have a lot of things on their mind. And so having, you know, setting something down, misplacing it, thinking that I brought it, but I didn't really bring it, um, are all things that, that happen as well. Yeah, in my take, I mean, <clears throat> it just comes down to the culture of the kitchen. At Christine's, like everyone knows each other very well. So like, we're not in the business of trying to screw anyone out of materials and stuff. I mean, if anything, people will text you and say, hey, like ran out of this. Would it be okay if I use this? If not, like, it's all right. Just wanted to ask, you know, ask. And people are a lot more friendly and like open to it. Um, you know, for me, like I've been there, you know, with, I forgot something. So for me, as a vendor in that space, like I am very open and friendly with people using my supplies and stuff, as long as they put it back, you know, that's just the only condition I give. Um, some other vendors, you know, may not be um, as loose or, you know, open to other people using their equipment. So, you know, I have seen people who will buy um, like locks to put on the doors if they have like their own fridge or freezer. Um, I have seen, you know, people who will, um, actually like not have all of their things available at the kitchen. They bring them in when they work in the kitchen and clean them and bring them back to their storage unit that they rent somewhere else. Um, I mean, there, there's a couple of different ways that people navigate it. 
Um, but if you ask me at the end of the day, it's, it's all about trust with other vendors in the space. Um, and I'm, you know, would doubt that, you know, people like Chris or Christine would bring in anyone that's like out to steal stuff. That's just not really the cultures that I've experienced at either of the facilities. Um, but you know, it happens, things are open. Um, you know, I think what's most important for a lot of things is you have to label your stuff. You know, there's a lot of people who just bring in things and don't put their name on it. They just put dates on things. And I'm like, well, make sure you also put your business name on this so that people understand what is available from the kitchen's perspective versus what is a tenant's own property. Um, so it's really important. Um, I mean, I've kind of failed to do that at times and I'm like, oh, why are they using my stuff? And I'm like, oh, well, I've left it on the dry rack and doesn't have my name on it. So like, obviously they're going to think it's a part of the kitchen. So, you know, like you kind of have to like sit back and be like, where did I mess up? You know? And like Chris said, I mean, we're just so busy doing things a lot of the times that we just forget. Um, and it's really quick to, you know, catch a temper and, want to blame other people but uh often it's kind of have to look at yourself and be like oh yeah i'm just not as organized right now so it's okay we're all vulnerable you know in the startup stages and you know to me it's it's something that you just have to be kind of open to and not assuming that people are out against your business and i think that's really helpful um Feel free, like I said, to post a question or to, to unmute yourself. I have a few questions I can ask as well, um, but I want to open up the space for you all. This is your session. This is your chance to uh, ask a couple of uh, experts. Uh, so feel free to hop in and do so. Um, I'll just mute myself for a few seconds and let you all do that. Um, but I do have some questions as well. I can hop in as well. All right, I will take that as an invite to ask a few prompt questions. Hopefully this gets the ball rolling. Um, I do want to, um, uh, I guess, first thing I'll ask, it's a nuts and bolts question. Uh, Danelle, you brought up um, insurance um, and things of that nature, uh, liability. Is there anything else you could speak to about that? Um, for people who are new to these spaces, they might not be aware that they need that insurance, especially that uh, up to million dollar uh, number it might sound a little bit high for folks. Um, and Chris, of course, if you have other insight on that, uh, feel free to speak to that as well. Yeah, you know, when I, I mean, just my background, I mean, I haven't really known insurance until I was like thrown into adulthood. So I was like, business insurance, like, what does that even mean? Like, what do I, I'm not like I'm going to a doctor or anything. If I do, it's under my personal insurance policy. So I'm like, what, what is this insurance? Well, what it comes down to is if anything happens, I mean, think about if someone gets sick, right? We've seen it on the news, like someone is probably gonna follow up with a lawsuit or something. I mean, legal things do come into play. So what I think most people need to be understanding is when we're talking about liability insurance it's to prevent yourself as an individual preventing you being sued for your personal assets versus the company's assets so as a sole proprietor i mean i'm i'm a single member owner of, of my llc structure i was like i don't want people to be able to sue me to take things like my bed away or my desk and all these other things I have in my personal possessions like nah y'all can't go for that stuff but you can take my other things that are associated with my business um so you know I'm not necessarily saying like I'm expecting that to happen but that's the protection that you're putting in place so liability a million dollar liability coverage is just very common I mean any commercial space will probably request that at a minimum other spaces may request a higher amount of liability coverage. Um, and it is essentially to say, you know, if a fire happened at the facility, you know, you're not necessarily, again, gonna be the only tenant in that space that has to pay for the damages. You know, you'll have insurance to help cover some of the expenses if 
you were found to be at fault for causing a fire, um, which is very easy to happen. If, if y'all work with grease and stuff, grease fires is a real thing. And I'm sure you get caught in the moments where you're like, I don't know what to do. Um, definitely don't throw water on it. I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, but, you know, there are other things in insurance that you may want to consider. Again, the million dollar liability coverage is very common. And for those who are like, how much does that actually cost me? Well, it depends on the building history and things like that. Um, so those, that's the type of information that you will need to speak with Chris about or Christine about so that you can pass that on to the insurance agent to get you a proper quote for your insurance coverage. However, the cost of it, I've seen anywhere from $500 to $800 a year for that specific liability coverage. Um, again, it, it varies depending on the space. Now, there's other things that you would wanna consider in an insurance policy, property. So though you have liability, you don't necessarily have coverage for your property. So again, if a fire happens in a kitchen and there's damage done to the building, but also you lost a lot of equipment and stuff, if you don't have property in, your property insurance, you won't get any insurance money for that equipment and stuff. So for me, like I didn't get that stuff because I was like, I don't need it. I'm using a lot of equipment at Christine's. But as I grew, I was like, okay, yeah, let me get like $50,000 to cover some of the property that I have in this kitchen. So that if a fire did happen, I do get some money back to cover the equipment that I already purchased. Um, there's a lot of other types of insurance coverages, but I can guarantee you if you start out with liability and property, you'll be pretty good in the startup stage. Um, so I guess that's my two cents on insurance. Chris, if you wanted to chime in too. Sure, I'll, I'll riff just a little bit off of that. Um, so at Fee Kitchens, we require the same amount, million dollar uh, insurance or <clears throat> Uh, feed kitchens uh, listed as a uh, otherwise insured on a on a document that the insurance company would would send us. Um, very common. It's uh, I think the the price range that Donnell gave you of five hundred to eight hundred dollars is is very typical for kind of a food cart catering operation. I think if you're doing packaged foods, packaged product, you probably find your liability insurance to be less um, less than that because there's just less less exposure. Um, I back that up just a little bit. Uh, when we, as when people come in here and they want to start a business, we they they run the gamut. So we have people who have been very successful in business, but they have never made a food product except, uh, you know, they made grandma's uh, cheese dip at the holidays. Everybody loved it and said, "Oh my God, you should make this and sell it to the sell it at a farmer's market." And so suddenly they're here starting a food business. Uh, then we have other folks who have, you know, who've traveled the world. I have, I have world travel chefs that are working out at feed kitchens. Wonderful to be around, um, but they haven't necessarily run their own business. They've worked for other people. So we have people that have, you know, really great chefs, no business skills, great business skills, no skills in the kitchen and everything in between. So one of the first things we work with people uh, is setting up their finances, making sure that they have an EIN number, making sure they have a seller's permit, making sure they have a business bank account that's separate from their personal bank account and that they are working with checks and that they're working with credit cards and they're not working in cash. So one of the big things a lot of people wanna do when they're first starting out, they wanna be informal. I was doing this out of my house. Well, I don't wanna hear that unless it was baking, but um, during the pandemic, certainly if you follow next door, if you're on Facebook, if your neighborhood is anything like mine, suddenly your neighbors are selling plates of food to their other neighbors. I want to hear it, Barb, I know you're on the phone call somewhere, you probably don't want to hear it either, but that's the reality, right? So as people move in here, we need to formalize them. We need to make them not just safe and legal for their food production, but safe for their business as well. And those are the first things that we work on. The other thing I wanted to, to highlight um, is that when you navigate the licensing aspects, um, I mean, insurance isn't really tied to that, but one thing that's important to help you be a more efficient or a less risky person is to do certifications. And so another requirement of being in these spaces is to be a certified food manager. Um, and typically you take a course, you know, for me, I took the eight hour course option through SurfSafe. 
um, where they did a full, a full four hour review prior to taking a two hour exam. Um, and you know, it was cool. I came out of fresh out of college taking that exam. So I didn't find it really challenging, but you know, if you're new to this, like you will want to study, you will want to be able to review all those materials. Um, cause those materials are going to be echoed time and time again through the sanitarium that you're working with on the licensing end. So, you know, it's really important that when you, before you even approach a kitchen to start production, like Chris said, you're going to need an EIN. You need your seller's permit. You need the typical business registration stuff. Then you need the certifications. Then you need the insurance policy. Then you can start to actually sign up that lease to, to be a part of the kitchen and start production. If you don't have those things in place before, take your time going through that process. Um, and to speak on the certification, sometimes they're not offered as frequent as you think. So it helps a lot to do your research and plan accordingly so that you don't tell yourself, yeah, I'm going to start business next month and then realize, oh, I don't have everything in place yet. So just keep those things in the back of your head um, as you're preparing to start. All right, so we've got just under 10 minutes left. I think we probably have uh, time for one more question. Uh, I, I have one that I'm holding on to, but um, this is your time, uh, like I said, to meet with these experts. So I'll, I'll, give, I'll open the floor if anyone else has a question. Um, of course, I'm sure Danelle and Chris are available otherwise uh, to follow up on email or what have you, but now's your chance. So I'll mute myself and let someone jump in. All right, so you guys are being a little shy. Uh, I guess there's a couple of directions I wanna go. One, I just wanna highlight, I think the point that, um, that you brought up, Chris, about people having different amounts of experience. Um, Barb, on our last, last week's call, brought up, you know, if you're really interested in doing this work, maybe think about working for another uh, food business if you don't have experience. I think that's great. Thanks for posting your email, Danelle. Um, but the question that I really want to uh, uh, bring up um, that you both spoke to is the culture of the kitchen. Is there anything more you can say about that as far as um, maybe the different types of, um, you know, experiences you might experience in different kitchens? Maybe how, Chris, you spoke uh, a bit about how you kind of try to proactively make sure it's an inclusive space. Um, but anything else you want to say to that? Um, because maybe that's not something people realize. They think more about the physical uh, tables, equipment, and whatnot. But obviously, we need to remember that really what makes these kitchens unique are the people. So um, anything else you guys wanna to say to that? And then um, I think Lindsay will wrap us up. Sure, so I think as you're visiting a kitchen and you wanna see it, I think it's, it's, it should be fairly intuitive as you walk around and get a feel and you're talking to the people that are touring you or they're talking to the people inside, you should be able to get a pretty good feel about what's, what's happening and how people feel about it. And certainly talking to producers outside of that. Um, I will say I started here at Feed Kitchens about five and a half years ago. When I first started here, things, it was a bit of a wild west. Feed was about two years into, into its operations. Uh, it was a little bit of the, uh, of the, the members here were running the facility instead of the, instead of the other way around. And, and it, it's certainly not the, the facility does not want to run the members either, but there needs to be sort of some mutual cooperation and it seemed that the, the scales were tipping a little bit more towards the members and uh, a, a bit of a, maybe a bit of a Lord of Flies situation going on here. Not, not terrible, but we did, we did catch it. Um, and so I would say, you know, certainly culture wise, <clears throat> I think when you're looking at a facility is, is knowing or finding out, you know, what, how much is staff present at the facility or, or other folks present at the facility? I think it makes a big difference. Um, you know, I tie myself to this facility. I'm not saying, you know, whatever anyone else did here before me was better or not as good or, but it was certainly different. And I think being here all the time helps create that culture. Now, obviously I need to be purposeful about what I'm modeling and, and be true to, to myself because the culture that I create is only gonna be a reflection of, of me. Um, but being here makes a big difference. So, so being present, being available for people, being able to step in and put out the fires, 
put out the crises, stop them before they, they blow up uh, is a big thing. And then beyond that is just open communication with people, right? Just being honest about what your expectations are of them and, and, and being, uh, being open to hearing what they have to say about what you're doing as well. Um, and, and that those things go a long way in the culture. And we make it part of our orientation as well. And just say, this is what our expectations here. This is what's gonna happen if you don't follow these expectations. Um, and I'm, I'm a pretty mild mannered guy. I think anyone on this phone call who knows me would say, oh my God, that guy's so mellow sometimes. I think he's, I'm not sure if he's sleeping or not. No, probably not that bad, but, but I'm also a dad. Um, and I can put on the dad voice and I can make the hair on the back of your neck stand up very quickly. Um, so don't try me because <laughs> it will happen and you only have to do it once or twice and you've set the example for everybody else. I don't want that. I'm not, I don't want that. That's not going to happen for me. So, um, you know, culture is an ongoing thing. It's an, it's an ongoing practice. I think you have to be, um, I, I think you have to be um, thoughtful about it. It's not something that just, that just happens because, because you want it to. Yeah, and I guess, you know, my two cents on the culture aspects, um, you know, I'm very centered on black and brown foods when it comes to my business. And so to see that Madison doesn't really have a lot of options. I mean, there's so many people who do soul food and I'm like, that's not like the only black or brown food available, you know, like there's so many other cultures that um, express foods in, in different ways. And for me, it was just really hard to see that in the Madison community as a consumer. And so I was like, oh God, like, where am I gonna go to work at that's gonna really, you know, have people who look like me or produce similar food products as me? Well, I'm gonna let y'all know that, you know, Feed and Christine's are some of the best places that I've seen like true cultural diversity in terms of the food options that are being prepared and the, the, the international cuisines that are being offered. And so, to that, it was just really comforting to know um, that those spaces do exist for black and brown businesses. Um, and, you know, the, the big thing is that you just have natural mentors, you know, like every one of these facilities, like they want local businesses to succeed. They're tired of corporate structures, you know, competing, um, you know, us out of the market. And so, you know, it's very local food driven. And by doing that, people are willing to help you out. Um, you know, they want to give you tips, tricks, you know, things to avoid um, and all of that. So it's it's there's just a overwhelmingly amount of joy and pride in the kitchens. And um, it's all for good reasons. Um, but I will also say, you know, a, a part of the culture in these kitchens is that. Uh, gosh, I mean, it's, it's, it's really something that you have to be in there and enjoy and just be open minded to. And that's kind of like the beauty of being an entrepreneur is that it's like, you don't really know the roadmap, you kind of just have to show up and do and these spaces just encourage that just simply, you know, as a space to, to really figure out, you know, how do you get to the next step in your business. Um, what I really love too is that, you know, if people are buying uh, similar packaging equipment, sourcing similar ingredients, naturally people are like, hey, can we share um, a bulk order of something? You know, some people are like, I need to go to Chicago to get the specific product. Um, and they're like, oh, well, I also need to go to Chicago, but I don't have the time to travel. So, you know, there's natural collaborations that kind of happen that type of way, as well as going out to marketplaces. I mean, you'll see vendors in the same kitchens going to the same events. And, you know, naturally those are some of your best supporters because they're spreading your business ideas. You know, they're, they're allowing new customers to learn about your business. Even though they're out there doing their thing, you know, they kind of uplift others who they work with. And so it's almost like you get free marketing when you establish or maintain healthy relationships with other vendors and like definitely don't sleep on that. You know, those are some of the best people to really get your business out there. Um, so that's the culture piece. <laughs> well, I see that we're um, about at time, but we just had another question come into the chat box. So what I'm gonna do is quick plug our fourth and final session next week and thank our speakers. And if they're gracious enough to stay on for another minute or so, um, I'd like to invite them to answer the question. 
Um, are there suggestions for ordering the basics and do you need to be there for delivery? But quickly, everyone, please, um, again, thank our speakers today. They were a really complimentary team in presenting sort of a holistic picture of what it looks like to work in a shared kitchen. Lots of great tips on today's session. We'll be following up with a handout soon. And um, for those of you that are interested in starting a food business um, using the cooperative model, please tune in next week, where again, we'll have the, the sort of the entrepreneur co-op um, member voice, as well as a voice um, from, from our colleagues at the UW Center for Co-ops. So with that, um, thanks again, Chris and Danelle. And if you don't mind taking that question, we'll just go ahead and answer it for folks that want to stay on a minute or so longer. All right, I'll take a crack at it quickly, Donnell, because I'm unmuted. But first, let me say what a pleasure it is to be a part of this workshop, what a pleasure it was to be to find out that Donnell was going to be co-presenting with me. I did not know that until I read the, the PR on it, because Donnell and I have worked together and we want to work together more. But here we find ourselves together on Zooms <laughs> for the last year. Uh, we're going to get together in person soon, though. Um, Ordering basics. So if Pete Kitchens, you can pretty much order from wherever you want to. And I would assume that, that that's probably true in any kitchen. Uh, it's always worth asking, you know, what vendors deliver to this to this space, because those are the ones you probably want to start with. And then if you're looking at other vendors, but, but here at Feed Kitchens, we have people ordering from U.S. Foods, Cisco, Reinhardt, uh, UW Provisions, Fox Heritage Meats, Golden Produce, Local Farms, going to Costco, going to Woodman's, you name it, Gordon Food Supply. You can order from any of those. We will help you. It's probably best to talk to other vendors here. Where are they finding the best deals? Where are they finding product? During the pandemic, it's been a bit of a scramble. We were, we've recently been scrambling for chocolate chips, believe it or not, um, for chocolate chip cookies. Um, that we sell through Willie Street Co-op. And if we couldn't make them, what we're, we're gonna lose a lot of sales. But it's been chicken, it's been rice, it's been packaging, it's been, you name it. Um, and so you're struggling, but you can order from any of them. We will receive for you. Uh, you that's the question you're gonna wanna ask any kitchen that you're gonna be, will you receive on our behalf? We also have US Foods actually works out of feed kitchens. Um, so we can connect you immediately with US Foods. It doesn't mean we push them over any other vendor. Uh, but it, but what the one of the advantages is is all the big vendors are going to have minimum orders. Uh, for Cisco right now, I believe it's two hundred fifty dollars. For Reinhardt, it's fifteen cases. Both those are a little tough to meet for any single vendor in this place. Um, but if you order from U.S. Foods, they treat the whole facility as a single vendor. So if Donnell just needed a case of uh, heavy cream for something that he was doing and he forgot it. He could order from U.S. Foods and they would have it here tomorrow, just a single case. Um, and so we can help you with vendors and we will receive your shipments on your behalf. See, just give me a little tip right there. You know, that's as simple as it is. <laughs> um, I don't want to duplicate a whole lot, but, you know, like Chris said, depending on the kitchen, they will kind of typically receive it for you at Christine's. Um, you know, I am, you know, it would be much easier if I was there to receive it um, because oftentimes delivery drivers request a signature um, on the invoice that they drop off. And so for me, there's not really a consistent staff at the kitchen. So I do kind of need to make sure someone is there to receive it if I'm not. Um, but there are food vendors. One, for instance, is Fortune Wisconsin, which supplies a lot of meats. Um, and they um, are, I'm sorry, not Fortune. It's Golden Produce. They have like a key to the facility. And they know exactly where to put stuff as they enter the facility. Doesn't really matter what the business is. They kind of are very familiar with coming in and dropping it off in the cooler uh, whenever it's needed to drop off. Um, so like Chris said, it's usually what it comes down to is uh, minimum or order requirements. Um, you know, it can be $250. Some places can be $500 or it can be based off of number of cases and things like that. Essentially, it has to be economical for their drivers to be able to offer that delivery. And so if you are starting off, you may find yourself uh, at a point where it just makes more sense to just go and pick it up yourself. Um, but it does factor in quite a lot of time to do that. So um, there's ways around it, but you know, it, it is important to kind of know who your sourcing options are as early as possible so that you can consistently order from them and continue to improve uh, the pricing of your uh, menu options. 
Um, the more consistent you are with your sourcing, the much easier it is to do the other business functions of your business. So. Super. Well, thanks again for making a little extra time and for your thorough answers. I'm sure it's much appreciated. Um, and thanks to everyone who joined us on the call today. Hope to see you next week at two. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone.